Now I would like to introduce you to our two speakers and to a very interesting talk about hardware attacks, hacking chips on the very cheap. And you know, all we all are hackers and we all like to tinker with things and when things get tinier, then it's harder and it gets more and more expensive and hacking chips without taking them apart and destroying them uh, up until now, that cost a lot of money, even if it came below the 1,000 euro mark. Uh, those people made it even cheaper. They want to give you some advice and some help to do it for maybe 30 euros. Please give a very warm welcome to Ramiro and Rafa. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much. The next talk is about hardware hacking, but not this kind of hardware hacking. And obviously, not like this one. It's more about this, about hardware hacking, uh, hacking chips. We have uh, a microcontroller, microprocessor, with some security features, uh, like keys, secret keys, secret passwords, or yeah, something to hide. So, we want to talk about how to extract uh, these secrets, how to extract the keys, the secret keys, or the secret passwords, or uh, how to bypass them, how to affect the, the behavior of the chip. So we just disable these security features. So who we are? Uh, this is my, my friend Rafa. Say hello. Hi. And he's awesome. Yay. Um, I am Ramiro, and of course, I'm also awesome. And we both work in a company uh, as security analyst, breaking into chips, the security of chips. Uh, that's our job. But uh, we do this with a very expensive tools. Of course, it's awesome. <laughs> we have very expensive tools. Even we have lasers for breaking chips. Of course, that's very expensive. It's not something that you can afford. So this talk is not about how we break chips in the, uh, as professionals. This is more about uh, how you can try to break chips. Well, laser are double awesome, by the way. Oh, this is low. That's, yeah. So this is about how to do these kind of things, uh, chip. So if you try to break a chip uh, using professional tools, you probably have to spend more than 5,000 euros, uh, probably much more. Uh, if you try to do it uh, cheap, you can buy something like Cheap Whisper, uh, maybe you can buy uh, scopes, uh, you can buy some uh, second-hand equipment, uh, but still it's like uh, 1,000 euros. But we will try to show you how it's possible still to do it like almost with not, uh, almost uh, like for free. So more or less the price of five beers, and if you don't drink alcohol, five mates. So, by the way, this talk is hacking hardware on the chip, and this is awesome. Uh, the talk was uh, prepared for one hour, uh, but uh, we have to squeeze in 30 minutes. We are not going to talk about uh, uh, very technical details, uh, so if you are interested in the technical details, please uh, come later to the Spanish uh, village and look for us. So, we are going to be as fast as possible on this. Uh, first of all, uh, disclaimer. Uh, what we are going to show uh, is two demos. Uh, we could choose a lot of demos about how to hack uh, things on the chip, uh, and we could choose about uh, well, we could choose a lot of chips to break. But we decided to go for these two just because uh, they are very viable. They are cheap. They are viable. So you probably can try to do this uh, at home. But the things that we are going to do here, they will probably uh, work also in different manufacturers like microchip or NSP or whatever. So please, uh, after this talk, I don't want you to think that uh, Atmel or ST are vulnerable. It's something that is general in all these microcontrollers, microprocessors, because these uh, are general ports uh, microcontrollers, and those are insecure. Uh, manufacturers have a secure version of processors, and those are harder or impossible to break with these techniques. But uh, regular processors are easy to, hit, to hack uh, this way. So let's start with the first uh, demo. Uh, 
uh, we are going to try to break a uh, challenge response uh, scheme. Uh, this is, for example, used in your car. When you try to start your car, the engine of the car, you have the key fob. The key fob uh, has um, uh, RFID chip uh, that has some kind of, well, this challenge response scheme. The car generates a random number, and uh, this random number is called challenge, and is sent to the RFID chip in the, in the key, on uh, the key fob. This uh, key uh, takes the random number, the challenge, encrypt with a secret key, a, a key that they know, and then the response, or the, the different test, is what we call the response, is sent back to the car, and the car is doing the same thing at the same time. It's just uh, using the random number, the challenge, and creating with the CN key, and uh, this way it gets a reference, and then it compares the reference. The number it generated, the car generated, and the number that it got from the, from the, the chip, uh, sorry, from the key fob. If the number is the same, that means that both uh, devices are using the same key. So the car will start, the engine will start. So how to break into this uh, scheme? Uh, we can try to retrieve the key. Normally this is done using uh, side channel attacks, uh, but we are not going to talk about this today. Uh, the other way to break this uh, challenge response uh, system is trying to break uh, the comparison. The moment that uh, the processor or the car compares uh, the reference that it generated uh, with the reference or the response it got from the key fob. So what we are going to try is modify the behavior of the chip, affect the uh, yeah, how the chip works. So in the moment that it's going to compare this, um, these two numbers, it will fail, and then if we are lucky, we uh, will make uh, the car uh, believe that the number is the correct, the key is the correct, and, and start it in the engine. This is called for injective, by the way. Um, we are going to do the demo with uh, Arduino, just because you can try this at home. Uh, you probably have one of these at home. And, um, what we are going to use is uh, voltage glitching. It's uh, a technique to modify the voltage uh, that is powering the Arduino. So we modify the voltage in the moment we want, in the moment that this comparison is being done. So this comparison will fail, and if we are lucky, uh, the Arduino will think that the number is correct. But uh, to explain how the voltage glitch is working, uh, let's make a yeah, kind of comparison of kind of, uh, yeah. Imagine in, in four years, the CC camp, uh, the organization decides to put the CC camp close to the club matic uh, factory. So they create some artificial rivers to make the matic flowing from the factory to the different tents. So everybody is happy. The party is uh, running all the night. So, but uh, an evil hacker get into the Scala system in the factory, hack the factory, and then the matter stop to flow through the river. What is going on is that uh, without the river of matter, the tents or the village start to use their own supply of matter in bottles to continue the party. So they continue drinking their bottles, drink, drink. And at some point, one of the villages will uh, run out of matter, of blue matter, and when you don't have caffeine, what happens to hackers? They go to sleep. So the party in the rest of the tents continue, but one of the villas, because has no more caffeine, no more club mate, is not working anymore. In the moment that uh, the mate, the factory, starts to produce mate and starts to uh, deliver uh, mate or, or the river of mate starts to flow, uh, the tents. Uh, continue with the party. And the tent that was sleeping, uh, just wake up and continue partying out. So something similar is what happened when we do a, a voltage glitching. Just let's substitute, well, let's substitute uh, the CCC camp with a microprocessor. And the village of the tents are the different parts of the microprocessor, like the uh, arithmetic logical unit or the registers, the fetch and decode uh, uh, mobile or whatever. The power supply or the factory is a power supply that is powering this uh, microcontroller, microprocessor. 
and the river of Mate is just uh, the internal um, internal uh, power lines in the chip. And the bottles of Mate is the internal capacitance of the of the um, of the chip, uh, because the way that the chip are made, uh, they they have an internal capacitance, so they can store it some uh, amount of energy. So if you remove the power supply from the from the chip, some of these models will still work, but uh, oh. some of them, if you remove the power supply, some of them will fail, and uh, it will fail when the rest of the models are working. So this is how a power glitch works. Uh, we try to remove the power in a very uh, short period of time, just remove very, very fast. So one of these blocks will fail because uh, it, uh, it has not enough cap internal capacitance. It will fail, the rest will not. And in the moment that the power supply is uh, back, uh, this model that was uh, faulty will continue to work normally. So if we are lucky and we do this in the precise moment that we are looking for, we can do things like uh, skipping instructions. Instructions. We can just uh, prevent an instruction to work. Or we can just uh, modify the instruction that the processor is running and convert in a different one. So that is a voltage glitch. So we made a special device, or well, a very simple device, uh, to do this kind of attacks. Uh, we call it a cheapo glitcher. And it's as simple as this. It's just uh, the target, the Arduino, that we are going to attack. Uh, the LPC Espresso is a developer uh, board for uh, NSP LPC microcontroller. And we only have to use uh, three resistors, one uh, transistor, and nothing else. This is the board we are going to use. You can use any other board. The thing is that uh, you need to create uh, a very fast pulse that is going to close the transistor in a very short period of time. I use this board, but you can use any other board you have. If you probably have one of these uh, yeah, uh, microcontroller boards, you can probably use this one, one of those. The cost of all this setup is, yeah, probably 20 euros or even less. At the end, we have something like this. Uh, we will show you how it works. Um, this is the result of this device. When I run this, uh, this uh, device, I get this kind of uh, shape in the, in the power line. So the power line is stable, and in the moment I want, I can just make a small dip in the power. If I make a very big dip, what is going to happen is that the, all the modules in the, in the chip are going to fail, uh, so the chip is going to restart, it's going to press it. And I, only am, I, am, I am interested in making fail only some of the modules, not all of those. So I cannot uh, make a very deep uh, hole in the power supply, uh, a very big, deep glitch. So um, let's make the demo. Uh, yeah, because we don't have too much time, I will just run it. Uh, if you are interested, just come later, and I will explain all the technical details. But, uh, uh, um. Can you put back the, the screen? Yeah, the screen, yeah. This is the firmware that I am running in the, in the LPC board. It's just a very simple firmware that I can just uh, tell uh, when I want to make the glitch, how long I want to make the glitch. And the Arduino is running a software that is uh, generating the number, sending the number. The number is sent like challenge, the random number, encrypted random number. Sorry, the random number. And then uh, you have to uh, encrypt this number with a private key and uh, send it back to the Arduino. And if the number uh, is encrypted, encrypted correctly, you will get an OK. If you um, not don't encrypt the number correctly because you don't have the key, you will get uh, an error message. So I will just run this. Oops. 
it's not easy. No. I cannot see because it is being reversed. Sorry. Yeah. Now. Okay. So the software is asking me, uh, is asking uh, how long I want the glitches, uh, when I want them. So I just put the default parameters. These parameters, I know they work. Uh, you have to tune these parameters, try these parameters. Uh, when to glitch, uh, normally is uh, in the moment that you send uh, the response. Uh, maybe some uh, micrometer, microseconds after sending the response. And uh, the wife of the glitch, you have to try until you get a uh, core value. And then I start to send the glitches. I try a glitch. I get uh, the board is uh, getting the response from the Arduino. And if um, well, yeah, so here you can see. It starts to glitch. It's getting the challenge oh, here. Is getting a challenge. I am sending just uh, the board is sending just uh, any response, and in the moment that it sends the response, it do the glitch. So, if I read the response of the Arduino, if I get an error, that means that uh, I didn't glitch correctly. So I restart the board. Uh, I try again. I try again. At some point, I will get an OK. That means that the glitch was successful. So I just bypass it this uh, this uh, comparison with the challenge and response. So. And it's not always working. It's just a matter of luck. So uh, with this setup and this Arduino, uh, you normally get uh, maybe 50% uh, of uh, chances or maybe 30% of chances of uh, breaking it. OK, so uh, Rafa is now going to talk. Oh, it's a different kind of attack. OK, so uh, can, can you hear me, I guess? Oh, yep. OK, can you switch the computers? Yep. OK, yes. OK, I will get the thing that clicks. OK. So uh, let me explain how to glitch devices, like, for example, a key for just checking this comparison and then glitch it. I'm going to explain a different kind of attack. For example, I'm going to attack, in this case, uh, crypto. I will, I will choose RSA. Why RSA? Because it's used for everywhere. So digital signatures, for banking smart cards, for PGP when you encrypt your email, for SSH logins without password, for a lot of things. So uh, if we compare RSA implementations, you will see that uh, RSA is very elegant. It's a really nice design. But it has a problem, which is it's quite slow. So in most implementations, they have optimizations. And one of the most popular ones is called RSA CRT. CRT stands for Chinese Reminder Theorem. And it's a special technique to compute RSA, which is something like four times faster. As you can see, it's uh, quite different because, well, this image with the penguins, it's faster, but it's also kind of dangerous, OK? It's not nice to have a pinging guitar rocket. So, this is the attack I'm going to do. It's called differential fault analysis on RSA CRT, also called Belcore attack or the microwave attack. Here you can see the maths, but OK, I hate math. So how does this work? OK, I don't want you to go into the full detail of maths. It's only three steps. It's a very stupid attack, but you will see how it works. So we have to obtain a faulty signature. We're going to send a message, and it, this device will sign it with the secret key. I don't know. And the nice thing is that we only need one faulty signature. If I get lucky once, I win. Then I need to obtain the normal signature. It has a star because this step is typically optional if you have the message. And how it works, I have to compute the greatest common divisor of this RSA public key modulus, which I have, and the difference of this faulty and the normal message. Okay? I just subtract them, and I compute the GCD between the public key and this thing. It's very nice because the result of this attack is the secret key. So with only one fault, you win. Just a mention that this step, the normal signature, is not even needed if you have the message. 
So in here, how do we inject the fault? Maybe you have heard about this story about the Raspberry Pi 2 that it crashed when you take a picture. OK. So the thing is, how silicon behaves against light? For me, it reminds me of the gremlins. OK. So let's put a short video to remind you how gremlins react about this thing. So when you take a picture to a gremlin, what it does is something like, ah! OK. So they die. So what we're going to do to the chip is something very similar to this. OK? So optical fault injection in 30 seconds, because I don't have more time. So silicon, semiconductor, that is used for making the chips, it absorbs light. And what happens when it absorbs light is that the transistors inside the chip, they start conducting. You change the status. So basically, you create a fault. And the interesting part here is that we need to open the chip. OK, so here you have a website in which Ramiro made in his home just a setup to open the chip. This, typically, you need some acids. You need a heat cooking uh, device, like a hot plate. You need an acetone to wash, OK? So if you go there, you can see a video. It's not that hard, but important. This is very dangerous. I'm not responsible for you burning yourself with acid or anything. I'm not liable for that. You're on your own. Be careful with this. It's very nasty. It can get very wrong. But you can do it. So how does this attack cost? OK, to open a chip, you need just acetone and need to get it, for example. Uh, the glasses, you can borrow it from your kitchen. A cooking plate, you can also borrow it from your kitchen. We will need a camera with a flash, so you can also borrow it. And the total cost of this attack is 9 euros. OK, I don't have any fancy hardware. I just need a camera and opening a chip. In the case of the Raspberry Pi, the package was already open. That's why it glitched. OK, so let's do this demo. OK, so I have here the setup. I'm not sure if uh, you can switch to this thing. I will try to move the tripod a bit. OK, so let's try to move this thing without putting chaos. OK. So here, what you see here, this thing is the microcontroller. Okay, It's uh, connected to my computer with a serial cable. I have here a tool for resetting it automatically each time I send a message. Because now, what will happen is that it will crash. Okay, So I'm going to start sending messages to this device. Okay, And this device is going to sign all the messages. I'm going to send always the same message. Okay, If you can put the video feed of my computer, you will see that now, here, the device is sending the message. I get a really huge response. This device is running RSA 1024 bits. And it's getting always the same response. OK? So disclaimer, if somebody has epilepsy, please close your eye now. And if you don't know about epilepsy, well, you will figure it out now. OK? So the thing is, I have this is a flash from a camera. OK? So this attack is as stupid as follows. When this device is computing RSA, I'm just going to shoot a flash. OK. And at this distance, the device is just ignoring what I'm doing. OK. If I get too close, if I shoot the flash, what happens is the following. Now you will see here that they get a yellow line. So the device just crashes. Why? Because I induced so much energy that the device just goes crazy and then crashes. OK. So now this device, this attack is just as stupid as taking a camera. It's computing the thing. And now, I hope the demo gods please help me. OK. If I do it right, it will not crash too much. OK. And I hope I get a corrupted message, but not a crash. OK. Let's try. Let's hope I can get it. Still no luck. Demo effect. Demo effect. I will try for three more times. If it doesn't work, I have a backup video. But please work. OK. One last time. OK. Uh, please work. It's so nice when it works. OK, last attempts, last two. Yeah, I'm cheating a bit, I know. OK, the last one. 
glitch. You, mm. OK, this typically works at the first attempt or the second attempt. The demo codes are not nice to me. OK, glitch. <laughs> and last one, OK. Well, it didn't work. OK, so now, because the demo codes were not nice to me, then this thing uh, only crashed or just reset. Or normal behavior. What happens is that if this thing I did just before coming here, if you start doing this thing, it can happen that then you hit it in the right spot, in the right moment, and what happens is instead of getting these yellow lines with a response of zeros because the device crashes, what you get in this case, you will see it as a red line in this script that I have. And this red line is just a corrupted response. It's crypto garbage. Actually, it's not crypto garbage. It's just a special garbage in which you can do this trick of subtracting the normal message and this faulty message. You see this red line? And that's all you need. So you can have RSA with super security if you don't have a special padding or any special technique. With only one fault, then what happens is the following. You take this computation, then I run, I run the mathematics, and what happens after that is, well, I take the module, I take the public key, I compute the greatest common divisor, and then what you get in result is what you see here now in the output. I get the whole RSA key. Okay? So this is 1,024 bits of key in no time. Uh, okay. I think we have no time for questions. You have, uh, unfortunately, we're on a very tight schedule, but for one question, I think we have time. So please curl up to the microphones. You, you got one question. Are there any questions? Yes, one question, please, over there. Um, yes, um, uh, well, you demonstrated the AVR-based ATML uh, Atmel, uh, controller, uh, Arduino. Um, I know that a lot of ARM cores, uh, they're having a power brownout detection. Uh, does this power brownout detection typically trigger if you flash it with such uh, uh, flasher? OK, so for glitching, for example, ARM cores, uh, this one is an ARM core. We can do power glitching in the same. OK, so this, in this case, you get the chip to ARM state, which is unknown, undefined. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. The trick is to find the correct setting of parameters. But even with brownout, brownout detection, these glitches still work quite, quite OK. OK, so a big applause for Ramiro and Rafa for this very interesting talk. It was really cool to see.